Hello, welcome to the checklist on gross income. This is a three-part checklist. The first question is what exactly is the amount of gross income? The next question will consider when do we have gross income, if there is any gross income, and then finally, who has the gross income? Now we're gonna use this checklist to determine whether a particular item is gross income. The court in Glenshaw Glass, a US Supreme Court case, held that an item is income if it represents an undeniable accession to wealth clearly realized and over which the taxpayer has complete dominion. So within this first question, there's three actual questions in the general rule. Recall that section 61, which defines gross income, says all income from whatever source derived. This general rule will help you determine whether it's gross income or not. So the first question, is there an accession to wealth? which means, does the item add to the taxpayer's wealth? The best way to consider this is by looking at the net worth of the taxpayer. Net worth is assets minus liabilities equals net worth. If the net worth increases, then accession to wealth has occurred. Assets can go up, liabilities can go down, or both. Clearly realized. Has the taxpayer realized the benefit from the item? So a realization event is really the triggering event that provides for income. This is distinguishing between items such as mere appreciation. The idea here is that there are certain administrative concerns that Congress has with respect to certain items of income, specifically with mere appreciation of value of pre-existing assets. So let's say that you own stock in a corporation. So you purchase it at $500 and a month later, the value goes up to $600. That change, of $100, from an economic standpoint, that is an increase in your net worth. Our net worth has been met. However, think about all the assets that you own and how they go up and go down in value all the time. Think about buildings, land, stock securities, all these things fluctuate. It would be an administrative nightmare for both the taxpayer and the Internal Revenue Service to have to administer a tax where you have to report all of this stuff every year. So this is really an administrative concern. And you'll see this theme throughout tax all the time. So administrative concern. In addition to considering the value with respect to the realization event, realization also requires what's what we call severance. Severance is the idea that the item must be separable from that which provides the income. It's important to note this because if something is distinct and separate, whether physical or legally, from the original item that produced the respective net worth increase, then it's considered with respect to realization. Going back to our stock issue, where the value has gone from $500 to $600, the taxpayer still owns the same share of stock that was originally purchased for $500, but now it's worth $600. Can that $100 be actually separated out? Can you separate the $500 over here and then separate the $100 over here? No, the stock is all one item. So there is no legal nor physical severance with, it, with that example. The next requirement is complete dominion. Does the taxpayer have full ownership and control over the item? This is dealing with strings. Are there any strings attached on the accession to wealth? So for example, let's say you find a really valuable Rolex watch in the parking lot. You go and you tell the police department that you found this watch. You want to make sure that the original owner gets the watch back. So you give it to the police and they hold it on your behalf. Now six months go by, a year goes by, no one claims the Rolex. After a year, the police department calls you and says no one has contacted us about the Rolex. The watch is yours. When you first received the Rolex, when you first found, when you first found it, there was strings attached to that because you gave it to the police department and said, if somebody comes and claims this, they can take it back. But when you get it after, after the police return, there's no longer any strings attached. The strings have been released. So now you possess complete dominion over that Rolex because nobody has a higher right with respect to priority in getting that item. This issue usually pops up more often with respect to deposits, with leases, and other arrangements. So it's important to note that a taxpayer must have all three of these, accession to wealth, 
realization, and complete dominion. If the taxpayer fails any of these three, then the amount is not considered gross income. Now, before we apply our general rules to some various to some various general ideas, I want to make sure that you stress that whenever a taxpayer meets the requirements, these three requirements, fair market value must be included. That's going to be important because when we talk about application, you'll see that fair market value makes a distinction in some of these examples. So the first general idea I want to consider are loans. If a taxpayer has a loan, which is generally thought of as a consensual arrangement under which the taxpayer has no obligation to repay the lender. So the idea here is there's no weird things going on. You know, it, it's, it's labeled as a loan, but it's not really a loan. Where the idea is that, you know, there's not going to be any repayment. You know, maybe your employer agrees, okay, I'll loan you money, but really they don't plan on you repaying them and it's simply just salary. Well, the idea here is that this is a genuine loan. If there's a genuine loan and we go through the three tests, right, we start with accession of wealth, which our net worth increases. Remember net worth, assets minus liabilities equals net worth. Net worth has to go up. With a loan, our assets go up, right, because we're receiving loan proceeds, but our liabilities also go up. So the net amount is zero. So our net worth stays the same. So with respect to a loan, there's no gross income. The next one I want to consider is unrealized appreciation. We discussed this generally on the general rule. Does the taxpayer have some type of property that has gone up in value? And simply that's it. It's just gone up in value. So we go through our three-part checklist. Has the net worth gone up? Well, if you own stock or other property, a building, land, and the value of the asset has gone up, and the liability stays the same, then net worth goes up. But what about the second test? The second test is severance. With respect to severance, you still own one share of stock. The value of the stock went from $500 to $600. Can you separate that $500 from that $600? No. It's all still the same stock. The value is inherent in that stock. You can't actually separate physically the $100, the $100 gain. Now you can if you sell. If you sell, you can collect $600 cash, right? And you can actually separate the original $500 and the $100 gain. That's the idea of severance. There's also legal severance for another topic. The next topic is deposits. Does the taxpayer receive a deposit? What we're really talking about here is are you leasing property and you receive a deposit? Now this is a specific issue. There was a case, Indianapolis Power and Light, a Supreme Court case that dealt with the taxability of deposits. This analysis just considers it generally. Let's say you receive a deposit where your tenant will receive the money back if certain conditions are met. They paid their rent all on time. There's no issues. Well, if we go through our analysis and you are the landlord, has your net worth gone up when you receive the deposit? Yes, because an asset's gone up. Do you have a liability? Not really. I mean, you might have to pay it back, but it's considered contingent. Contingencies, by the way, are not liability issues. Contingencies are issues of dominion control. Anytime you have contingencies involved, that results in number three, which we're going to get to in a the next part to look at, severance with respect to realization. So have we realized something? Yes, because let's say the deposit is $100. You actually received $100 cash. That's a physical severance because you actually have that cash. It's severable. Third, dominion and control. Are there any strings attached to this respective item? So strings attached. Well, in our example, if the tenant makes good on all the obligations, all the contingencies, repayment has to occur. We meet net worth we meet realization, but we fail to be in control because there is a possibility that the taxpayer, the landlord, has to repay the amount. Finally, the last consideration, the last general idea I want to consider is the idea of bargain purchase. This is where fair market value is important because, again, I wanted to keep that in mind, the general idea of fair market value. So if you have to include gross income because you meet the general rules, accession to wealth, realization, and domain control, then you include the item received at fair market value. Bargain purchase. Did the taxpayer benefit from purchasing an item 
below its economic fair market value. Let's say you buy a car from a dealership and the economic value is $50,000. If you are a great negotiator and you get that car for $40,000, you've paid $40,000 cash for an asset worth $50,000. It seems like there's $10,000 there of benefit. Gross income is a term of law that's defined through social policy, congressional intent, economics, accounting. It's basically a big idea. Gross income is a big pot of various issues, right? We have accounting, economic, social, administrative, different things. Congress decided that fair market value, which is defined actually in the estate regs, reg 20.2031-1, fair market value is what a willing buyer and a willing seller agree on. So it's not the economic fair market value like you might think. You might be able to turn around the next day and sell that, that car you purchased for $50,000 even though you actually got it for $40,000. You got the benefit of the bargain, yes. It must be arm's length. We look at arm's length when we apply this analysis. So this is why things like coupons, if you go to a store and you buy something for below the amount, you don't have gross income when you have a coupon because you're getting it. It's part of the, the bargain, what you're purchasing, as long as it's arm's length. We're going to learn later on that there's various relationships, themes we have to consider, such as employer-employee relationship or family relationship with respect to gifts or corporate shareholder relationships. So these are just some general ideas out there that we're applying general rule to, and you see how it works. So now that we've considered the application of the general rules, accession to wealth, realization, and dominion control, there's some specific rules that we need to consider with respect to gross income. The first one I want to mention is treasure trove, and I used this as an example earlier when you find something. Whenever a taxpayer finds something, the key really is dominion control. So let's say you find a Rolex in the parking lot of one of your favorite supermarkets. When you find that Rolex, that Rolex has value, $20,000. When you receive that item, if there's no dominion control issues, if there's no strings attached to that item, then your net worth has gone up because you, have the, you now have this asset in your possession. There's no strings, right, which we're going to get to. You have a realization event. Is it severable? Yes, because whenever you have services, there's severance. Because the idea is that you've performed, you, you have your fruits of your labor. Think about those people on the beach that are metal detecting. They're actually doing work and they actually find something. This is a treasure trove idea. Treasure trove just means that you find something like a treasure hunt. And finally, third, dominion control is usually the key with respect to treasure trove because many times whoever finds the property tries to turn in a lost and found or the police especially when it's something really, really valuable like the Rolex. So if there's no issues with dominion control, then you meet all three of these. Now the question becomes, when do you include? When you actually meet all three of these items. And we include at fair market value. Now there's a great example of this in a case called Cesarini versus US. In Cesarini, the taxpayer purchased a piano. When the taxpayer had the piano worked on and cleaned, it was opened up and lots of cash was found inside. This is considered a perfect example of treasure trove. Now, there was no idea who owned the cash. This piano was such an old antique piano that it would have been so hard to locate the actual owner of the cash. So at the time it was received, the issue was whether the taxpayer had to include it as soon as it was found or later on. It was an issue of tax years. It's the fair market value when all three of these criteria are met. Net worth, realization, main control, all three are met. And again, the key is the main control with respect to this transaction. The next specific rule I want to go through, barter exchange. Did the taxpayer participate in a barter exchange? What exactly is a barter exchange? This is where you're performing services in exchange for property. So let's say you're a tax preparer. You prepare taxes. And you need to get some dental work done. 
So you have a dentist. Well, everybody needs their taxes done. So the dentist is going to need some tax work done. So you're going to perform tax work in exchange. The dentist is going to perform dental work. This happens. No cash is changing hands here. But the issue becomes, what is the value of that tax work? Let's say that it's work worth $500. And the dental work, since this is arm's length, is also $500. We're going to impute a few things here. Let's say that let's say that instead of the tax preparer making an exchange of services, the tax preparer provides tax work to the dentist for cash. Well, the dentist would pay $500 to the tax preparer. No one disagrees that all three requirements, net worth, realization, domain control, are met with respect to that $500 of cash because services are performed. So that's gross income. So how can we impute that here? Well, we're going to impute that when the tax preparer provides services to the dentist, it's as if the dentist is turning around and paying $500 cash to that tax preparer for those services. And then the tax preparer turns around and pays that dentist $500 for the dental work. So when we're considering the tax consequences to the preparer, it's easy to see that if there's imputed cash, it's the same result as if the tax preparer just simply worked for the $500 cash. Now the last thing to consider, there's specific items in the Internal Revenue Code that under our three-part test, accession to wealth, realization, domain control, it's easy to see that somebody has gross income. However, there has to be some specific rules, specific rules, special rules on how to calculate. These items include alimony, which is under section 71, annuities, which is under section 72, prizes and awards, which is under section 74, and other various provisions. Items that aren't considered gross income that might be seen as gross income. So the first is imputed income. Let's say you're an accountant and you perform tax services that you normally do for clients and you get $500 per hour for your tax services. If you do your own tax return, your own tax services, should that be income to you? Well, economically, yes, because it's as if foregone income, you don't have to pay another accountant to do the services. With respect to gross income for tax purposes, this is not part of it. Gross income does not include imputed income. And the idea here is that this is an administrative nightmare. This would be crazy for the taxpayer as well as the IRS to have to report all the times where you're mowing your own grass, you're cleaning your own house, driving your own car, and how that's considered income to you. It'd be an administrative nightmare. There's administrative themes throughout the Internal Revenue Code that take certain items out of certain definitions. And this is a perfect example. Another one is free samples. Let's say you go to Costco, Sam's Club, and you get those free samples at the store. Is that considered gross income? Well, your net worth has gone up. I mean, you, you have this free sample now. I mean, a better example might be something more tangible, not just the food you know you put in your mouth, right? And then it's gone. Well, yeah, you don't have the asset anymore. Yeah, you eat that cookie. The cookie is now gone. But when you have a cookie, it's worth something. When I receive books from publishers, these are considered free samples. They're free to me. I don't have to pay for them. So this does not include, gross income does not include free samples because, again, it's an administrative nightmare. So again, we see the administrative theme. So here, imputed income, not gross income. Free samples, not gross income. So the next item is frequent flyer miles. Frequent flyer miles are a very interesting topic because you can acquire frequent flyer miles through many different ways. You can purchase them. You can get them by personal travel on your own account. You can get them through you can get them through business travel on a business account, even though it benefits you personally. If you purchase frequent flyer miles, there's no tax issues because paying with cash. What if you acquire frequent flyer miles personally on your own personal travel on your own personal account? If you acquire them personally, the idea is remember that fair market value? Fair market value is what a willing buyer and willing seller agree, which deals with arm's length transactions. So when you are dealing with an airline, that's part of the price. They include that in there. It's part of that. So it's part of the fair market value of what you're purchasing. So therefore, personal frequent flyer miles are not considered gross income when you receive them as a result of traveling. What about business? 
What if you acquire them for business purposes and you have a personal account? So you travel, let's say you're an auditor, you travel a lot and you have your own personal frequent flyer miles account for various airline. What if you use those miles later on on your own travels, your own personal travels? Is that gross income? Well, under our tests, under our net worth, yes, your net worth has gone up because you now have these, these frequent flyer miles which are worth something. What about severance? Is there any separation between what, what has occurred and the actual item? Yes, you now have the frequent flyer miles. So we have net worth, we have realization through severance. And finally, do you have dominion control? Well, as long as you can use those in any way you see fit, then yes, you have dominion control. This is gross income. However, if you do not plan on converting the frequent flyer miles to cash or some other form of property, maybe you sell them to a third party, that's the key. You can't convert frequent flyer miles, these frequent flyer miles for cash or other property. Then under IRS notice 2002-18, this is fine. It's not gross income. So even though it meets our test, it's not gross income. The idea here is that this is another administrative burden because what was happening is valuing those frequent flyer miles is really a pain and there's an issue with valuation. And another thing is, what if you don't use the frequent flyer miles? They lapse after a while. You get an email you know, from your airline saying, oh, you haven't used these, they're gonna go away. You have to use them. Well, you don't use them. You shouldn't have to include gross income if you don't use them. The IRS said, you know what? For two purposes, valuation and use, valuation and use, if this happens under this notice, even though it meets gross income, because of administrative reasons, we're not going to include these frequent flyer miles as a result of business travel on your personal account. So this is a special rule. So again, valuation and use because you might not use them. So this is a really interesting rule. Look it up. It's IRS Notice 2002-18. So this really concludes the first step of what is gross income. Whether you have it, and if so, what is the amount?